Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me for another restful episode of True Scary Stories to Help You Fall Asleep. Today, we're going to get back into the Missing 411 series. And even though the stories that I'm going to be talking about today were not written nor researched by David Politis, I figured it would be in good faith to give him a shout out. So, if you want to go check out David Politis and his Missing 411 works, I would highly recommend you do so. They're good books and good documentaries. Go check them out. Also, I'm going to have another narrator read the first story again. This time, it will be Furberry's Fables. If you like his narration, his channel will be linked in the description down below. Make sure you go check him out and drop him a subscription. After that, all the stories will be read by me, as always. Now, without further ado, lay back, relax, and enjoy these true Missing 411 stories. I'm very new to this type of subject and was talking to some friends who told me about this subreddit and that I should come over here and share my experience. I live in Colorado, and the RMNP is pretty close to me. I'm pretty outdoorsy, and so I tend to walk and hike all over my beautiful state. Usually I just do day trips or 24-hour stays outdoors. Quick campfires and small meals. Me and my dog, mostly. I was hiking just last fall in Grand Lake, a trail called Tanahatu Creek. It was about 1.45 p.m. The dog wasn't with me at the time, because they're not allowed on trails. So it was just me and myself. I was walking southeast, when suddenly the area went completely silent. No wind. No animals. Not even the smell of the outdoors. It's like I walked into a bubble where nothing existed, or where everything was muted. I took out my phone to check the time and it was just after 3.45, though it seemed there was a weird fog around me. I kept walking, the silence still there, the odd feeling too. I walked for another good 10 to 15 minutes when I turned my attention to the sky. The clouds seemed to be moving rapidly, as if a storm was coming. The forecast did not call for any rain or snow that day. It was odd to see low-hanging clouds that were moving so rapidly. Almost as if I was viewing a time-lapse video. I heard a rumble that came from the ground. It was emanating from what I assume was deep below. A large crack that sounded like thunder ended the rumble. The clouds stopped moving quickly, but had a very light pink-purple tinge to them. It was at this point I was speedwalking, trying to get out. My fight-or-flight response seemed to kick in, and my adrenaline was pumping. The odd feeling in my gut turned to complete terror, yet there was nothing around me to evoke such feeling. No wildlife, no bears, no mountain lions. Another crack and a flash of light later, everything seemed to be completely normal. Wind returned. The birds that filled the air with sound was now replaced with the sound of crickets. The only strange thing now was the time. It was 6.30 p.m. I was already on my way back to the truck before this all happened, but it should not have taken me that long to get back to the trailhead. It only seemed like 15 minutes had passed, and yet more than four hours had elapsed. I have no recollection of what happened in that time, besides what I have written here today. I have only told a few people this. Some said I was abducted, Others said I entered a time slip. Either way, I wanted to share. So, 
I've been doing research on missing 411 related cases in my home state of Minnesota, specifically in northern Minnesota. I found a bit of a cluster near the Chippewa National Forest. That's a whole different post that's coming though. And while researching that cluster, I came across this case. Details are listed in the links at the bottom of the post. The case of Peter Archman is very interesting to me. It wasn't near any national forests or parks. Though, there are plots of Minnesota state land all over the area that Peter went missing. The things that really stand out to me on this case are the details that match the 411 profile. He was elderly, slash unlikely to be able to travel long distances on foot. He disappeared near water, and dogs were unable to find a scent. The whole story is just strange to me, especially with no signs of foul play, no history of mental illness, and also the fact that the National Guard got involved with the search. I know a lot of people are assuming there was a medical emergency, but the facts just don't make any sense. Has anyone else looked into this case? What are your thoughts? I'm still trying to wrap my head around it. It has come to my attention that the news story isn't accessible to a lot of people. So here's the information from the article in the form of quotes. It's strange. Case County Sheriff Tom Birch said, as his department has followed many leads over the years, but still haven't found any trace of Archman or his belongings. This case remains open and we're trying to figure out what happened to him. We want to bring comfort to the family and give them closure and answers on what happened to them. The day Peter went missing was like any other day on the farm. It was around lunchtime, July 24th, 2009, when Peter got into his vehicle to head to Staples. He was going to pick up some milk and bananas and his wife's medication and drop off a check at the caterers for his granddaughter Simone's wedding, which was scheduled for the next day. Peter's abandoned vehicle, described as a light blue 1995 Chevrolet Caprice wagon, was located in a mud hole off Case County Road 32, as though it was stuck at the end of a minimum maintenance road the next morning. The groceries and medication Peter purchased were still on the vehicle. However, there were no signs of Peter, his walking cane, or his keys. Peter also had very little money on him, only about $30 in his wallet, along with his driver's license and his green card, which all are missing. These items were never found, even after extensive searches for over a month, which included up to 50 cadaver dogs, the Minnesota National Guard, and other agencies assisting the Case County Sheriff's Office in the search. The rest of this article is mostly just personal background information about how Peter met his wife and things that aren't really relevant to the case. There are also many quotes from the family talking about how they still don't understand any of the circumstances, even 12 years later. I was reading the article about the missing hunter being found after 53 years to my friend, and he told me that his father went hunting in the late 60s with a fellow hunter, but when they got back to return home, one of their party was missing. His body was found years and possibly decades later. He can't remember. When the body was found, it looks like he sat down among some rocks with his rifle and just died. My friend thinks this case was in the late 60s or early 70s possibly missing 411 relatable due to it being a hunter, large open area, found among boulders, possibly near a national park in Utah, etc. Is there a searchable database for 411? A three-year-old boy and his puppy disappeared nearly 40 years ago in Sugarbush Township, Minnesota. Only the dog would return. Terry left his younger brother Kevin alone to play with his toys for less than 30 minutes while he went to make his bed. Terry would go to look for his brother a short time later, and Kevin nor the puppy were anywhere to be found. Kevin had wandered out of the house before, 
but hadn't made it much further than the bridge about a mile away. The town began to search with the police for him, but couldn't find any clues of where he might have gone. Officers went as far as following leads from psychics and using a plane to fly over the area with a thermoscan device to measure differentials and temperatures. But still, nothing was found. What do you think happened? It blows my mind how a little guy could get so far away without a trace. Last winter, I was visiting with my wife's family in the Adronax and went out to the area where Tom Messick went missing. We parked on the side of the road and hiked down to the pond at the end of the trail, trying to identify the specific rocks where they were seated on during their hunt. I'm a former special operation officer and a paratrooper, so Tom's case really piqued my interest as I had some free time during the holidays. I've read some analysis on this subreddit and wanted to give some environmental factors observations and my belief of what happened. The first thing to note is that there was no gunshot heard during the time of his disappearance. It was actually incredibly quiet based on reports. Secondly, given the amount of dead leaves on the ground for the majority of the year, I figured that there would be at least some noise. Secondly, given search efforts that covered a very wide area, I assumed that there were few places he could disappear, with the exception of the pond at the end of the trail. To get to the pond, he would have had to walk by some folks that he was out with. As I went out, there were two things that I believe are of use. One, there is a running stream, and it's fairly loud. It runs almost parallel to the walking slash driving trail that they were close to. The stream is on the same side of the trail as the deer drive, and it's certainly loud enough to drown out leaves crunching at 100 yards. Two, there's a medium-sized marsh about 100 meters by 50 meters, along the path to get to their position. If one were to go across the trail and walk a straight line from their position, or follow the trail back, it's easy to fall into. I truly believe that he is in that marsh. I think he wandered off or became disoriented and after going back to pee or stretch his legs, he got lost in the woods. As he walked away, he fell in, couldn't get out, and sank. My less favorite theory is that he was killed or died naturally and was removed from the area, which could be a reason that the others who were with him stayed so long. On January 22nd, 2022, Thomas Tommy Howe, a 24-year-old from Antioch, Illinois, crashed his car into a highway guardrail, then swerved back into traffic and hit a car. The two pulled over into the median, and then he fled the scene, running into the woods. This occurred in Libertyville, a wealthy Chicago suburb. Luckily, it doesn't seem like the other driver was hurt. Howe was on his way to lunch with his parents, after seeking counseling for his mental health earlier that day. His parents reported to media that he'd been struggling with his mental health due to working from home during COVID-19. He lived with his friend in a downtown Chicago apartment, and he'd recently extended his stay with his parents due to his mental health. Despite all this, his family stressed his productivity. Tommy is an incredibly smart, kind, and hardworking young man, a college graduate, a working, contributing member of society. Before running into the woods, he left his personal cell phone in his vehicle, which his parents later tracked to the lot where the car had been towed, as it was totaled. The only evidence investigators ever found in the coming days was his work cell phone, located in the middle of the woods in Metawa, 
another wealthy Chicago suburb, in proximity of the Libertyville crash site. Just days ago, on Friday, February 11th, his family announced a $10,000 reward for information related to his disappearance. This is the same day a kayaker spotted a house North Face Jacket, Shoreside, on the Des Plaines River near Libertyville and called the police. Due to river conditions, police could not retrieve Howe's body until today, Tuesday, February 15th. Police have not explained why he swerved his car into the median, nor why he then swerved back into traffic and hit someone's car. Upon finding his body in the Des Plaines River, police have ruled out foul play. I'm from the area, so I've been following this missing persons case closely for the past three weeks. Wishing peace for the family. Corona's been a hell of a time for many folks. It's nothing to be ashamed of, whether you're conventionally contributing to society or not. Please keep well, everyone. Weird folk tales from my grandparents. I'm from Southeast Asia, a small island. Up until recently, the 1990s, it was undeveloped and people more or less lived near the water with rare communities inland. My grandparents on my dad's side had all these superstitions and stories that I got to experience as I'd stay there in summer months as a kid. And I'm glad to remember some of them. I know it's not much, but I'd like to share. Never pee on mushrooms, even by accident. Other beings live there. In a circle of mushrooms, you should never talk negative or act negative around at all. Always be home before the plants and trees could no longer cast shadows. If it's that time, but your shadow and only yours is cast on the ground, you need to leave the area right away. If you're in a forest at night, for whatever reason, it's better to leave the light off than to turn it on and have other things see you. Never play around cemeteries or places where people have died. Never step on plants around there either. Never have trees too close to your house, at least 20 feet away. Not because of it falling during a storm, but because the things that inhabit the trees would harass you and into your home. If your name is being called and the voice isn't something slash someone you recognize, then run away and don't answer or look towards the source. Happened to my grandma while she was walking home from the field. Had to go up a mountain to get there. She was walking back down to her home near the sea. Always have clear markings between your property and the forest. Had to help my grandma cut jungle growth every now and then. Also had a fence around the property. If for whatever reason you're walking in the forest and everything goes quiet all of a sudden, you had to repeat, I'm allowed to walk here, out loud five times. Always walk on paths made by people, not by other things. My grandparents never explained who the other things were. Apparently, they used to share the island with another group of people, but they died out a long time ago. My grandparents say this was the oldest story they had. They had dark skin, darker than ours, thick hair, and were short of height. My grandparents never described them as evil or having bad intentions. Instead, they were just annoying. A long time ago, they'd steal food, take your chickens, take your plants, etc. They were really good at hiding in the forest and were good at fishing. Actually, if anything outside ever went missing, I'd often hear people say, oh, they did it, referring to them. I was never allowed to go deep in the forest as my grandparents believed they still existed in some pockets on the island, although they kept to themselves now. I'm mostly posting this to see if anyone else has these tales too. As we become more advanced and cities get bigger, A lot of these old tales, some of them probably even older than we think, are being lost in the face of modernness. A way of living that was practiced for thousands of years is slowly being forgotten. As far as I know, the island now has stable electricity, and internet was starting to be common around five to eight years ago. It's a tourist hotspot now, and properties are developing everywhere. However, the geography makes it so that you can really only build near the water, as the terrain is too steep or hilly in other places.
I'm a 17 year old female who recently found out about this subreddit. I'm not new to Reddit or anything paranormal slash cryptic. I mostly joined because I grew up watching ghost adventures and fact or fiction paranormal files. All total BS, but it goes to show that I've always been aware and interested in this stuff. But after reading others' experiences, I figured I should share some of my own in hopes of getting any advice or answers as to what could be messing with me. I live in Florida and have always been aware of many Native American cultures, even though I'm not of that heritage myself. I'm not sure if this is pertinent, but anyways. I timelined and tried to write down everything that I remembered about these experiences to give me a guide when writing this. It started from when I was very young, and the first instance of this happening was when I was living with my grandmother. Her and I were very close. This will play in later. I was wide awake in bed, unable to sleep with her to my right. There's no doubt in my mind that she was deeply asleep only a few inches away from me. Every television in the house was off, and the only other person in the house was my grandfather asleep in his room. Then, very clearly and loudly, I hear my grandma call me from the kitchen, almost how you'd be called to dinner. I know it's common to hear your name being called mistakenly, but I did more research on this as a teen, and apparently when you hear your name being called this loud, you're supposed to reject it. I did not. Not knowing this, I just huddled closer to my grandmother and kept my eyes locked on the open door. The second instance was around 13 or 14 when my father took me on a family trip to Las Vegas. We visited some part of the Grand Canyon, and while my family was waiting in line for a skywalk bridge that we had paid for, I wandered around the edge a good distance away from my family and decided to yell my name into the canyon to hear my echo. When it came back to me, it sounded distorted, and almost like my grandmother had yelled my name back. It might not have been my grandmother exactly, but very similar. Nevertheless, just the fact that it was distorted was enough to scare me a little. I don't put much weight into this experience because it might have just been my voice being thrown around the canyon weird. The next one happened when I was 13 or 14 as well. It's the most terrifying one that I've had, and every time I tell this story to people, I start to cry and tear up. This is the closest I've ever been to whatever this is, and proves my point that it's mimicking people that I care about. I was on vacation with my family in Key West and had rented a home. I invited my best friend, who we will call Ash, to stay with us. On the third day, we had decided to skip out on the boating trip and mooch off the house owner's Netflix all day. On about the fifth episode of what we were watching, we decided on a snack refill and a bathroom break. We pause the television and I make my way to the kitchen. I believe that Ash had followed me to the kitchen and leaned on the island while I prepared some chips with my back turned to her. I held a full conversation with whatever that thing was and even looked back at her on her phone. I fully had no doubt in my mind that I was talking and looking at Ash on her phone. She even held it in this specific way that Ash does. I turn my back for a split second to pick up the bowls and suggest we head back to the couch. When I see Ash walk out of the bathroom, which was a solid 30 feet away, my body immediately went cold. And the first thing I asked her was how she got to the bathroom and in and out without me hearing. She then gave me the weirdest look and told me she's been in there the whole time since we got up. This is where I start freaking out and insisting that I had just been talking with her and even physically saw her. She joked about doppelgangers and how maybe she was going to die. I quickly suggested we get out of the house and walk around the neighborhood. She then informed me she had gotten her period while she was in the bathroom, the same time that I was talking to whatever I was talking to. We walked around until my mom called me that she was back in the house. We're still best friends to this day and have been for 11 years. And I asked her about it today before I wrote this. She said she didn't hear me talking with anyone at all. Now, at this point, you guys might think I'm crazy. But for this next one, I have a witness. I felt a little less crazy after it happened with people who freaked out just as much as me. Again, I was on vacation near the Great Smoky Mountains, but just a little west in Sevierville, Tennessee. We had our previous reservations canceled, so we took this little rundown cabin owned by a local woman. Now, we got there late at night, and the moment we all stepped out of the car, the first thing we heard was a man's voice saying, Hey, neighbors. 
coming from a cabin to the left of ours that was higher up on the mountain that we were on. We couldn't see the cabin really, just a road that led further up. So we assumed that he could see us, but we couldn't see him. Probably just some guy on his balcony. My friendly stepdad yelled a hey, and we waved up towards the direction that it came from. Wouldn't have been weird if this didn't happen every time we stepped out of the cabin or car. My family completely wrote it off as some type of hospitality that we're not used to in Miami. Retelling it, my brother and my friends agreed that it was weird. I did hear constant footsteps around the cabin at night, and some outside my window. It was a little raised cabin, probably a story or two off the ground. But I didn't give it much thought, since wildlife is a thing in the woods. Just something that I thought I should mention, maybe. The thing that really propelled me into researching what the heck was happening was when I was having a photo shoot in the woods behind the cabin, and both my brother, sister, and I heard something calling my name deeper into the woods. Since I was with my younger siblings, I went into full big sister protection mode and almost threw them back down the little slope that we had to climb to get to the woods. We were all scared to death from how clear it was and how we all pinpointed that it was coming from deeper into the woods and nowhere near the cabin. This was during the day and we were all so thrown by this that we stayed in for the rest of our trip. We all agreed it was a woman's voice and the first thing I asked my mom when we got inside was, did you call me? She had been lounging in her room with my stepdad all day, trusting that I could take care of the younger ones just outside the cabin. She saw how freaked out the kids were, and we didn't really go out that night or for the rest of our trip. I think I reacted this badly to this one mostly because I had kids to take care of, and I can tell that they were terrified out there. Again, the voice sounded like somebody was calling for me, or calling me back somewhere. With no knowledge of what this could be, I had finally decided to look into things when I turned 17. I had no previous knowledge of Wendigos or Skinwalkers or anything cryptic. Only crappy ghost investigations and Zach Baggins making something out of a scratchy EVP. I'm desperate for answers, because at this point, I'm constantly thinking about it and driving myself into rabbit holes of information and myths and legends. If you read this far, thank you so much. I know my writing and recounting may not be that great, but I was just trying to get everything and all the details in a cohesive place. Please let me know what you think this is. And please feel free to ask for more information on something if you think that it would aid in you helping me out. Much love to anybody who can help. Ray. Missing girl in Catskills Mountain and her story after she was found. Catskill Mountains, New York. There was a family gathering at a relative's home in the woods of the Catskills. The adults were mainly inside while the children were playing outdoors. While the others did whatever they were doing, Jill, a little girl of five, became fascinated with the butterflies and no one noticed her chasing after them into the woods. Ultimately, the adults checked back in to find that she was lost. Many people searched many hours in vain, and dusk was coming, bringing a great deal of despair with it. Then, suddenly, a besmudged Jill came running happily out of the woods unharmed. What had happened? Once Jill had followed the butterflies for a while, she lost them, and realized that she was lost herself. She tried to find her way back to her aunt's house, but only got deeper into the forest. She thought she heard someone calling for her, but it was too far away and she couldn't get a direction on it. Finally, she came into a small clearing. Feeling very tired, she took a candy bar from her pocket, sat on an old dead tree, and ate a little. She felt lonely and started to cry. She looked up and saw standing at the edge of her clearing two small living dolls with silvery hair to their shoulders. They were dressed in shiny green clothes and had caps. She offered them some of her candy bar, but they didn't respond. Beginning to cry, then she asked them if they knew the way to her aunt's house. They nodded and motioned for her to follow. As dusk came on and the forest darkened, 
of little dolls became accompanied by small balls of blinking colored light, which illuminated the way. They all seemed to be going faster and faster as they went, and Jill was surprised at how fast she was moving. The dolls then abruptly stopped and pointed to the aunt's house. Jill happily turned to thank them, but they were gone, and she ran back to her parents. My dad isn't technically missing anymore. I'm just trying what I can to find any advice or leads. And this community has members that could possibly know of resources that I don't. I don't even know what park he was in, but maybe someone here could help me narrow it down. Not knowing is hard. My father died in or around Bear Creek, Arkansas in March of 1994. I have his final letter that was written to me a few days before his death, where he describes his campsite near a 60 foot drop and a strange man who approached him a few times. When I was a child, my mother told me that he unalived himself. His family disagrees and thinks foul play was involved. Unfortunately, my father was intensely private and not close with really anyone. Most who knew him are either unknown to me or dead. The only information, which I'm not even sure if it's true, that creates a common thread from what I have heard are a few details that seem to be agreed upon. He fell from a 60-foot drop while in his wheelchair. He was a paraplegic. He climbed back up, of course, using only his hands. He bled out in his tent, and his remains weren't found for about two months. If anyone thinks they can help me find any information on this event, I would be eternally grateful. I've tried many hours of internet sleuthing, but I've never even found an article relating to any bodies found in that area in that time frame. My hope is someone out there knows of information resources that I don't. Or heck, maybe someone will respond who lives or has lived in the area and has some old newspapers or something. I don't know what to expect, really. All I know is the older I get, the more it bothers me that I don't know what happened to him. I've even tried calling police localities in that tri-county area, hoping to find officers that were active at that time that would talk to me. I've had no luck. I'm just hoping for someone smarter and more resourceful than me, who can even find a lead or advice on how to proceed. I know there are some rules against full names. I'll post his known names. I'm not sure what his legal name was at the time of his death. His name was changed a few times in his life. I do know the name that he's been buried under, though. His headstone name was engraved by his adopted mother, though. And I'm not really sure if it was his legal name at the time. If I can't post it, I'd gladly PM this info to someone who thinks they can figure something out. Edit. I wanted to include the name that I think he was going by. William Luther McCord. Thanks for those who read through. The more people I reach, the better chance I have at possibly finding more information. My uncle, an experienced outdoorsman, went missing and was found under strange circumstances. I'm looking for answers. Hey all, I found this subreddit and kind of just trying to reach out and test my luck. Missing person, James McGrogan. My uncle was a missing 411 case back in 2014 and nothing makes sense about it. He was an experienced outdoorsman, camped by himself in the Alaskan wilderness but was found dead a month after he went missing, near Vail, Colorado. Authorities ruled it an accident, said he fell to his death. It came as a shock to my family, and we all haven't been the same since. And I've been finding out stuff that I was never told. He was found wearing no cloak, gloves, or boots, but still had his helmet. He was found 14 miles away from the original trail, and would have had to have make the hike in deep snow. His original search party looked in the area and didn't find him. Once he was found, 
They said they had looked in that area already. My uncle was no idiot. He had with him all the necessary supplies and rescue gear. So what I'm really getting to is I want some answers. Even if it's just what do you think? This has really messed my family up. And it would be nice to have some peace. Around 10 years ago, I had gone on a short hike in the Green Mountain National Forest in Vermont, around the base of Mount Glastonbury. It was just a short day hike that I planned to find an old railroad bed and check out the remains of the old ghost town there from the 19th century. I had gone before with a group of people, and it was a beautiful hike with water, and culminates with a great view of the area from an old fire tower. Thankfully, I was not completely alone and had brought my dog, BB a three-year-old Rottweiler. She was good company for a trip like this, and I was glad to have her along. I parked on an old logging road and found the path to the trail that would take me to the abandoned railroad bed that is now buried deep in the woods. It was a mile or two in, and almost to the railroad bed, when I heard something. It was whistling, the kind someone would use to call a dog. Instantly, BB looked up and tried to bolt to the right of the trail where the sound was coming from. Luckily, I had a good hold on her leash and stopped her from running off. She barked in the direction of the whistling, but I got her to set and the whistling stopped. I had a strange feeling. Even though I could not see who was whistling, it felt like it was directed towards BB, and someone had tried to separate me from her. I was not sure what to do, but after a minute or two of no more sounds, I dismissed it as a coincidence and continued on our walk. Not ten steps later, I heard a woman's voice from the other side of the trail. Hello? Come here. We're just off the trail. Then I heard what sounded like a playful laughter of another woman. The tone of the calls was playful, almost seductive. Hello? Come down here. What's your name? I was curious, and even a little intrigued to check it out. The voice was very pleasant, but after a split second I stopped myself from moving. Looking to the left where the voices were coming from, I could almost see a path through the woods, down the ridge, a perfectly straight line. There was no noise, not even the rustling of leaves or chirping of birds. I started to feel lightheaded and confused. BB barked again and I snapped out of it. A feeling of complete dread then overtook me. I reached into my pocket and pulled the Ruger LC9 I had in a pocket holster out and held the pistol to my side and clicked the safety off. As soon as I did that, I began to hear things again. Leaves rustling, sounds of birds tweeting. Looking to the left again, the path that had just been there was gone. After that, I decided to end my hike and we booked it back to the car without incident. The strangest thing was yet to come. When I got back to my car and drove off the mountain and had cell phone service again, my phone had been blown up with missed messages from my girlfriend and brother asking me where I was and why I was not back yet. I checked the time on my phone, and it was 4 p.m. I had started my hike around 8 a.m. I had been gone for eight hours, and could only account for a couple of hours of the time. To this day, I have no explanation of what happened. I don't hike anymore, either, and I took up golf. There's an area of Quebec that my mom won't go near. Now, we don't go into Canada that often, but we used to have an aunt who lived in Quebec, and she owned a cottage on a small, remote lake. My summers were spent at this college, and a lot of my family would also come up to visit. Behind this cottage was a huge forest that spanned for miles and miles. We used to go on hikes and remark about how untouched it was. You could easily get lost and never come out. One day, my mom, my aunt, two uncles, and myself, age 13, were out on a hike heading towards a raspberry patch that we knew of when we heard a scream like nothing you had ever heard before. It was a human scream from a female. 
but it was so loud that we all dropped to the ground as if someone was shooting bullets. I don't know why this was the reaction we had, but down we went. All of us stood up, stunned, and looked around. For about two to three minutes, we looked in every direction, assuming it was something near us. The scream was like it was on top of us and all around us at the same time. If you had told me a jet fighter had passed over us 30 feet up, I would have believed you. I remember my mom suggesting we go back. This sound clearly wasn't from any animal, nor was it from a machine. It was human, very human. My uncle suggested we keep going, and everyone else kept going in further. By now, two to three minutes had passed, and we were all on edge, but we assumed it had to be something totally explainable. Then it happened, and as God is my witness, I'll never forget what I saw. The screen came back, but this time it was accompanied by something. My aunt saw it first and pointed to it. Then we all saw it. About 50 feet away from us, and probably 30 feet up in the air, was a person gliding through the forest. It looked like someone sitting cross-legged, all in black, with long black hair. We didn't see where they started, but we could see them slash it moving through the treetops, just under the canopy, at what had to be 10 to 15 miles per hour. We watched as it went past, deeper and deeper into the forest. We could see about a football field's length away, and just stood there frozen until they were out of sight. Then we ran. We ran until we were back at the cottage. My mom never went into that forest again. My uncle went out with his rifle the following day, but came back empty-handed. The cottage was sold years later, once my aunt had passed away, and nothing was ever seen again. It was not a bird. It was not some pet monkey that escaped. It was a person. 100% a person. And whatever it was just flew through the forest as if it could fly on its own. My aunt went to her grave believing that it was a witch. And if you had told me for certain that that would really answer a lot of things. To give you an idea of how it looked, think the girl from the ring, only in all black. I'll go to my grave wondering what I saw. I hope one day I get an answer. Edit. Since everyone is being so nice to me about this and taking it seriously, and not telling me that I'm full of crap and whatnot, because I'm not, I know what I saw, I'd like to add in some more context to this in the event that someone has experienced anything similar. The lake this cottage was on was sunken into its surroundings. It's almost like you were surrounded by mountains, but those mountains were actually just the main level and it was the lake that was deeper into the earth. This meant that we went back into the forest. We were almost always walking uphill. A very gradual slope, mind you, but a hill nonetheless. We used to see a lot of weird things in the woods, as you do in any woods. But these were things I've not really seen in any other woods before. Giant boulders the size of a small school bus that had clearly been moved in recent years. Areas with several healthy trees just broken in half, not from being cut, but like they were snapped. And a significant amount of berries. So many berries you could run a grocery store. I've never come across fields and berries like this since that time. We used to joke that there were Sasquatch in the forest. Many years ago, I saw a video of what appeared to be a witch. And quite frankly, it's the closest thing to what we saw that I've come across. Below is a link to the video. Keep in mind that this is only similar and not dead on. But every time I watch this, I feel 13 years old and back in that forest again. Imagine seeing this only much closer. It was clearly a person setting and it moved faster. Also, this was in the daytime in bright sunlight. Well, as bright as a forest will allow it to be, but still quite bright. I also got the location. This was at Little Lake Brompton, just outside of Sherbrooke, Quebec. On Google Maps, it's called Petit Lac Brompton. To make it easier, I've marked the location, give or take a few hundred feet, where this happened. Please keep in mind that back in the 90s, there were no roads or other houses there. It's been developed somewhat since its time, but not a lot. Thank you for reading.
Hi, everyone. I wanted to share my mom's story. I'm not good at telling slash writing stories, so pardon me. My mom grew up in Paraguay. For those of you who don't know, it seems to be a lot when I tell this story. Paraguay is a very small third world country. The area where my mom grew up is especially rural in the countryside where most of the poor people are. Her house was across from very thick woods that stretched for miles. One afternoon, before it got dark, my grandma and mom were outside. My mom was about seven at the time, when she spotted what she described as a beautiful little white baby chick. She's always loved animals and enjoyed catching them, so she wanted to catch it. It kept running away from her, even though it seemed like she was just about to catch it multiple times. After what seemed like she was running in a circle for minutes, my grandma came out of nowhere and yanked my mom's hair. My mom said at that moment she was broken from a trance, that the sun had already set, and she was actually very deep in the woods. My grandma smacked her really hard on the head and told her that El Pombero almost succeeded at taking her. My mom tried to explain to my grandma about the very pretty little chick, but of course it was nowhere to be found. My grandma said my mom seemed to be playing normally, and then all of a sudden just started fast walking towards the woods. My grandma thankfully ran after her and was able to catch up to her. I always think about what would have happened had my grandma not been there to stop it. I'm glad she was there. This happened in Grindstone, Pennsylvania back in the 90s. I was probably about eight years old, and my brother was about five-ish. We lived on a couple of acres in the country, with a farm on one side and your basic farm fencing with thick forests on the other side. With growing up in the sticks, my dad being an avid hunter, us kids were taught to be aware of our surroundings and wild animals and things like that. Also, we were taught not to just wander off without telling an adult and not to trust strangers, the normal safety stuff that kids are taught. Anyways, as a kid, I thought the woods were creepy slash scary. There was no way that I would have went into them by myself. So I was playing outside with my little brother and he went into the house. There I was by myself and I heard my mom calling for me. Kimberly, come here. Kimberly, over here. Come on, Kimmy. This was a little weird to me because why would my mom be in the woods right now? I climbed over the fence anyway and started walking towards my mom's voice. Then out of the blue, I felt like I was being watched and got a bad feeling. I started to wonder how my mom got into the woods without going past me. You know, just thoughts like that. So I turned and quickly ran back to the house where I found mom at the kitchen table and my brother playing video games in the living room. I then asked her if she called for me and she said no. And I told her what happened. This led to us kids being told to stay inside and play for the rest of the day. I'm now in my early 30s, and I've asked my mom about this incident, and she swears she never called for me. There's something about this situation that really bothers me to this day. So, I'm posting this from a throwaway, simply because I know how people treat people who post weird stuff. Call me a coward if you want. Still, I've been reading about Missing 411 and I wanted to share some things that my grandmother taught me, did, or said in passing that I've never seen anywhere else. First, background. She was born in 1914 or 1916. She lived alone until she was 90 or 92 in a solitary house in the edge of the woods. She was spry and maintained her yard and garden religiously until she had a stroke that killed her. She was Christian and watched preaching every Sunday. Her home was in the lee of a mountain. One, she buried metals at the four corners of her property. I don't remember exactly, but I think it was iron, copper, gold, and silver. 
The directions, I think, were North Iron, South Copper, East Gold, West Silver. Two, she loved trees, but she would not allow trees to grow closer than 10 foot apart on her property. When I asked her why, she said, I like the trees, but I don't want my yard to be the woods. Three, she put lines of salt across the entryways to her home and at the gate into the fence around her property. Four, speaking of which, she maintained a fence around her entire property, about two acres. When I asked why, she said, good fences make good neighbors. There were no neighbors for hundreds of yards. Five, one day I was stacking rocks. She knocked over all the stacks and told me, never stack three rocks together. If you find them stacked together in the woods, don't touch them. Six, she told me that I should never be in the shadow of a mountain during the blue hour at sunset, except inside a place that is well kept. Her yard and gardens she defined as well kept. She told me that if I felt uneasy in the woods during the daylight to stand still and say, I will walk here, it is my right. Being in the woods at night, on the other hand, she said was stupid. Eight, she said not to wear bright colors in the woods, that things can see you, same as people. She also said to not wear camouflage. You're not a tree and you ain't fooling nobody. She herself wore old lady blouses and floral prints, so those were apparently acceptable. Nine, she told me to take berries from the verge in the sunlight, but never eat berries that are in the deeper woods. Ten, she told me that if you see white berries, banana berry or doll's eyes, obviously don't eat them, but also don't go near them. She actually told me to step back several steps if I ever spot them, without turning around, and then turn around and get as far away as possible. I never knew why. 11. She said that if you're walking along the bank of running water, make sure to turn away from the water and walk into the woods a few feet sometimes to stay on track. I'm not clear on what this means. 12. If she found a ring of mushrooms in her yard, she would set a smoky fire in the middle. I don't know the logic behind this. 13. She maintained a margin around her property where she didn't allow any plants besides grass to grow. If vines tried to grow in, she called them feelers and would set a fire in that area to burn them back. 14. Lest it sound like she was at war with nature or something, she also had the greenest thumb of anyone I have ever met. Even in her heavily shaded yard, she grew vegetables in quantities I have never seen before or since. She had six tomato plants one year that produced literally bushels of tomatoes, whereas when I try to grow them, I'm lucky to get three tomatoes off of three plants. So what does this have to do with missing 411? I couldn't help but think all the things that she told me that seem related to the common themes, what to wear, what to do, etc., in mysterious cases. I don't know what knowledge or superstition my grandmother was drawing on. She wasn't Native American. She wasn't a witch that I know of. She wasn't some kind of druid as far as I know. But she definitely had opinions and told me directly what I should and should not do. And I followed them to the T and have always had pretty good experiences in the woods. Edit. I also thought that I'd add, she lived directly next to the Southern Appalachian Cluster. I've lived in a small town in Kentucky for my entire life, and because of that I've been surrounded by the mountains and the woods for years. My current house is literally nestled into the woods in the middle of nowhere, and thus outdoor activities have taken up a huge chunk of my time, especially in the summer and fall. I'm in the woods almost daily, hiking to the creeks to fish or the meadows to hunt, and I know the woods and trails around my home like the back of my hand. That said, there is definitely something that calls to you while you're in the woods, especially when you're alone, and I've just now realized it after stumbling upon this sub, before I'd just brushed it off. Now, it's hard for me to ignore. My parents began allowing me to hike alone when I was around 13, but I didn't really get into it until about two years later when I was 15. Even then, though, 
I wasn't allowed to go very far, and I always had to carry a walkie-talkie with me so that I could contact my family if necessary. Later, at 17, I'd be allowed to carry a handgun with me, but that's neither here nor there. There's stories I can tell at that age, too, but this one takes place when I was 15. Before I get into it, I should mention that I have two outside dogs, Max, a black lab, and Bo, a beagle. I've had both since I was very young, and they're very smart, always staying by my side when I'm in the woods. They always listen to me, until this day. I was hiking a trail that runs up beyond my aunt's house, one that I'd hiked day in and day out, just out and about enjoying the woods. It was in October, so the weather was cool, not hot, and I'd been hiking for about an hour. The trail comes out on a spring that runs down from the top of this particular mountain. It hadn't rained lately, so the spring was mostly dry and covered in leaves. I remember looking up the mountain, which I'd never hiked to the top of before, and feeling this strange call. It wasn't really a voice, but it was an urge that I couldn't ignore. Keep in mind that I'm a very timid person, and hiking unfamiliar trails on my own freaks me out to this day. But that day, all my fear had dissipated. All thought left my head. I just climbed, higher and higher. My dogs followed me. I don't even know how to describe the feeling that came over me, but I remember just staring down at my feet and feeling at peace as I climbed. There was a moment when I paused to look out the houses below. I'd never been that high up, remember, and I felt amazed. I took a picture on my phone, and then I looked around me for my dogs. Bo had already run off and Max was following. I called out to them frantically to stop, but they didn't listen. They disappeared. At this point, looking down the mountainside, I was very afraid. Then I looked back uphill and it came over me again. I kept hiking. I couldn't stop. Eventually, I heard my walkie-talkie crackle. Everything was distorted, and I couldn't make any of the words out. I assumed now that I was just out of range for it to pick up, but back then it freaked me out. Whatever had come over me lost its hold on my mind. My dogs were still gone. Panicked, I began running downhill. It's a wonder I didn't get hurt. As I neared the wide section of the spring near the bottom, my walkie-talkie picked back up, and I heard my dogs running downhill behind me. I got home and mostly forgot about it. I just told myself that I had almost been lost and to be more careful. Flash forward many years now, and I still hike. I commented a short version of this second story on another post, but I'll add it back here. At this point, Max is very old and no longer hikes with me, so it's just me and Bo. Last year, I hiked up to a cave behind my house as I've done a million times before, and then I started following a trail that I'd never fully explored just out of curiosity. Bo was ahead of me per usual, but when I called her back, she'd come. We hiked for the better part of 45 minutes, following a pretty simple trail, and then I figured I'd better be heading back, because it'd be getting dark soon. And yet, I couldn't stop. I kept telling myself I'd go out just a little bit further, just to see a little more. I remember looking down at my feet, just like before, and listening to the silence of the woods around me and feeling at peace. It felt so easy just to keep going deeper and so difficult to turn around. Bo felt the call too, because even after I did break out of it and turn around, only after stumbling upon a root, and then called back to her, she wouldn't stop. I had to catch up with her and physically turn her around and pet her before she'd come with me. I don't know if these stories belong here or not, or if anyone will even read them and take them seriously, but they've been on my mind a lot. What if I hadn't stumbled over that route? Or what if my mom hadn't decided to contact me at that moment? How deep would I have hiked? And what waited for me in those woods depths? I don't know what's out there, but I know this. The woods call to us all. This was about three years ago in Big Bend National Park. 
my friend, my husband, and I were all going on a trip to do some primitive camping. I'm not a hardcore camper, but I've done my share of primitive camping and hiking. So I like to think that I have some wilderness sense. I know what common animals are like having grown up in eight acres of forested land. Coyotes were frequent visitors, so I know how creepy they can sound. That's why I know what we encountered that night was something else. We arrived at Big Bend around 4 p.m., checked in, and set up our tent and campsite. Nine Point Draw. It's a pretty desolate location around the entrance to the park. The campsite is about 25 miles to the visitor center and lodge, and about 40 miles from the Rio Grande Village. So we were not near any kind of civilization that I know of. We had the idea that we would go for a night hike to a nearby trail after having dinner that night. So in preparation, I decided to scout out the trail from our campsite. The terrain in this part of the camp is totally flat desert with some ground vegetation, so we thought it would be an easy route from our campsite to the trail. The trek from our campsite was not difficult, but as an added precaution, I put up rock piles for us to follow that night. After dinner, we decided to head out around 10 p.m. The first 10 minutes were pretty uneventful. We were all in good spirits. Suddenly, we hear a scuttling noise about 50 feet behind us. Having been used to animal noises at night, we wrote it off as some critter. A few minutes later, we heard the same noise a bit closer and sounding like a bigger animal. There are black bears here, but we weren't in the area they're normally sighted. Like I said, the landscape was wide open and we didn't see anything with our flashlights. We were a bit uneasy but willing to go on. The rock piles had been doing a good job of leading in the right direction. All at once I stopped. I felt absolute terror. It's an indescribable feeling. I see many others in this sub also reference this same feeling. I knew we were in danger. I just didn't know why. I looked to my friend and my husband who both looked as terrified as I felt. There was no sound. No wind. Then, in an instant, the most inhuman scream erupted, seemingly all around us. We all froze for what felt like minutes, but I'm sure it was just seconds. I don't remember making the decision to run back, but the next thing I remember, we were all running. We had made it pretty far out, even though I thought I was running in the direction of our camp. I remember scanning for the piles of rocks that I had made, but not being able to find any and almost turning back thinking that we were heading in the wrong direction. But I had this instinct not to. We made it to a rather large rock that I knew was on our way back to the campsite. I also remember putting a rock pile beside the rock. I went to check if it was there to make sure that we were headed back to our campsite. The rocks were still there, but they had been knocked over. This set off all the alarms and I told my friend and my husband that we had to get back to camp as soon as possible. We made it back a few minutes later. By the time we got back, I was nearly freaked out, and I didn't want to stay. I think my husband was as well, but my friend convinced us that it was just wildlife, so we stayed in the tent that night. I don't know if it was connected, but there was scuttling and footsteps around the tent all night. Either way, I did not sleep. We did not do any more primitive hiking that trip and opted instead for a campsite in one of the community camps. I've never felt that feeling before or since, and I've been in the woods at night plenty of times. The next day I went out to check if all the rock piles had been knocked down. They had. I don't think an animal would deliberately go around knocking over the markers. That's what really makes me think that it was sentient. I don't know what it was, but I don't want to know. And I'm glad that we made it out. I love to hike in the deep woods. The less people, the better. I've done it many places, but Shenandoah is one of my favorites. I was doing an eight mile hike deep in the woods on a little used trail because it was a difficult level trail. I spent the entire day hiking and had a small lunch and only saw three people the entire day. 
on my way back to the Big Meadows Lodge, I started to hear the scariest thing I've ever heard. Small children started to giggle. I was about five or six miles from the road, and there are no other trails in the area that could have crossed this. Still, I figured it was a trick of the woods and sounds carry. I walked more, and the giggling followed me through the woods. I never saw anyone or anything, and thought I could identify two or three different voices giggling. Soon afterwards, I started to hear the creak and slam out of an old screen door. I recognized this sound because my father had a cabin in Michigan that had a door that sounded just like this. This went on for about two miles, then it simply stopped. I've not shared this before because I figured most people would think I'm lying or crazy. My wife doesn't even know because she would make sure that I never set foot out in the woods ever again. Once, I did an eight-day solo trip in the high Sierra Nevada mountains, wandering through granite boulders strewn mountain faces. I didn't see anyone for four days up near the high Sierra route. I've hiked the Trinity Alps solo for seven days, but saw plenty of people. I always had a GPS and PLB, and I'm thankful for that. I love the outdoors, love the adventure of the mountains. I took my children on their first backpacking trip this summer when we could, right off of route 108 near Pinecrest Lake. I'm an NOLS semester graduate, and before a trip, I consider all the risks, weather, and usually overpack gear because I don't mind a heavy pack, and I like to be comfortable. I plan my trips month in advance and obsess over maps and Google Earth for fun. I have a wilderness map collection. I used to lead summer camp backpacking trips in college. I've been a lurker in this subreddit for a few years, but never really got into 411. I just watched the Hunter movie, since it was posted on Amazon Prime, and I can't sleep. I'm thinking of all those times where I felt something, but of course it was nothing, because there's nothing out there but trees, the rocks, and the animals. Maybe a bear. But I felt something out there, and now I wonder what I felt. I'm not sure I'll be able to bring my family back into the woods. I'm sure I will, but... When I do, I think it'll be difficult to relax. I'm worried if I watch the other movie, I won't be able to stop thinking about it. But maybe I'm not supposed to stop thinking about it. A few years ago, I wanted to visit the very first place I backpacked, starting at a trailhead of the Appalachian Trail near Gorman, New Hampshire, that follows a creek named Rattle River south of the Androsagon River. No one wanted to go with me, so I hiked it mostly at night starting at dusk. I just wanted to go to the swimming hole near the lean and was able to take a dunk in the water before heading back. I didn't see anyone, but I kept feeling like there must be some bears nearby. Hiking at night is scary on its own, and I won't be able to do it again. Certainly not alone. One time near Hetch Hetchy, my brother had to drop his backpack on the bridge trail near Tiltill Creek on our way to the Rancheria Falls. We had the whole family with us, including my child who was one year old at the time. I got them to camp and at dusk left to go get the pack. The whole time I felt on edge, like I was being watched by bears. We had run into bears several times in the area. At Tiltill Creek, I got the feeling that something had been waiting or watching the pack. I got it on and hustled out of there, figuring bears or other critters had been smelling the food. But now I wonder, I like visiting Mono Hot Springs Resort and hiking to the hot springs late at night when you can have them all to yourself. There's been a few times when I've felt like there's something nearby which I suspected was a cougar, bear, or bobcat, but it felt more aware. Looking back, I wonder now. I'm more worried about my kids, letting them wander in the granite, playing on the rocks. It's terrifying. How do you sleep at night after watching these documentaries?
I've now and then read possible missing 411 cases from here, but never gave them too much thought, even though I found them interesting. Somehow, I thought these cases usually only happen in the United States. However, today I had my finished writing exam, where I had to write about the theme, Human and Nature. I had six different materials, of which I had to choose two of them, to construct my writing around. One of the materials talked about how Finnish people are now known as the Nation of Forests, but we certainly weren't fans of forests hundreds of years ago. The material talked about the fear of forest bears and wolves, but there's also fairies and other supernatural beings. There was one term that caught my eye. It was the term Metsanpetun. Rough translation of this would be to be covered by the forest. The term was explained by this. One, human or animal, in the forest could lose sense of time and place. They'll feel weird as the surrounding forest became unusually quiet. No bird hummings, no noises of life. They may see the forest upside down or do other unexplainable things that no normal human being would do in a forest, as if they were teleported to another dimension. One who has been covered by the forest disappears as if into thin air. No one else can see them, even if they walk past them, nor can the person who is covered by the forest see others. I thought I'd share this finding. In my exam, I immediately thought of missing 411 cases. I just find it so interesting that Even in the 17th century, this phenomenon was known and feared by a nation that practically lived in forests. And to be honest, we Finns still do live in forests, as they cover around 75% of Finland's land area. This is my first post on Reddit. I usually just lurk, but I think it's time to finally share my story. I'm 29 years old, and this happened about 13 or 14 years ago. Back in the day, the soldiers who have been stationed here would go out to train in the woods. We would go there almost every day, checking the shooting ranges for bullets, shells, etc. Whatever we could find. Since I'm half American, I would like to talk to many of the soldiers and often we would trade beer or chocolate for some MREs. In this forest, there used to live a woman. We called her Waldhex. Guess you could translate it to forest witch in English. This woman lived in the woods for 25 years. The last thing I heard about this woman was that she got arrested by the police and is locked up in a mental asylum. We often talked to this lady, and she would talk about random stuff that made no sense at all. She often talked about Witchell Minor, I have no clue what the English translation would be. Maybe some kind of dwarf slash imp, but I'm not too sure. She even showed us the clothing she sewed and crafted for them and said it was some kind of tribute so that she can live peacefully in the forest. Judging by the size of the clothing, they had to be like a foot tall. Anyway, on this particular day, me and two buddies decided to ride our bikes deeper into the woods just to explore and maybe find a new shooting range. In the distance, we saw a person sitting on a log beside the trail. My friend was like, that has to be the witch. Turned out she was right. As we got closer to her, she stood up and blocked our path. She was really angry and asked us what we were doing out there. We've told her that we just wanted to go explore the woods some more. This is about the time I was a little creeped out. She started to say weird things about crab and mention some kind of crab humanoids. At one point, we've had enough of her crazy stories and we just kind of laughed her off. I said to her, well, maybe we meet one of your friends along the way. We hopped back on our bikes and just as I was going to pedal off, she suddenly grabbed my arm. It was a really tight grip that she had on me. With a kind of creepy smile, she said, I warned you. I told her to F off and let me go. We kept advancing deeper and deeper into the woods and joking about the things that she said. We maybe did about, I'd say, two more kilometers until the trail was so bad that it became impossible to ride a bike. We have taken a break and decided that we need to turn around. 
all three of us were just sitting on an old log, and suddenly I got goosebumps, and even my eyes have gotten a little bit watery. I look over to Daniel and notice he has goosebumps too. Mark, my other friend who was with us, said, You guys feel that too? Feels like we're being watched. Daniel's the type of guy who always goofs around and stuff, and I would have bet all my money in that moment that he would say something like, The crab people are stalking us, just to break the tension. But he didn't. Instead, he said with this serious tone, We should get out of here right now. We were riding out of the woods at a really fast pace, and it felt like forever to get out of there. We've never really talked about it, not even after all these years. I have goosebumps writing this part. I was really scared that day. The silence was what freaked me out. You didn't hear a bird, a branch falling off a tree, nothing, just dead silence. Who knows what is out there? I thought this story is fitting for the Missing 411 subreddit. I've been following Missing 411 for a good two years now. I apologize for my English, it's not the best. If you have any questions about the Wald Hex or anything, I will be around to answer them. Thank you for your time reading. My experience happened back in August of 2014, but it's still very vivid in my mind. I was unaware of the missing 411 phenomena until I stumbled upon this subreddit recently. I was on a youth group camping trip in New Hampshire. We were coming to a close after two days of uneventful camping, and I was tasked with going to tear down the archery range, a temporary makeshift affair we set up for the youth to practice shooting bows and arrows. The archery range was down the hill from the campsite, and then down a slight slope to the left of the trail road to a small oval clearing abutting the woods slash tree line. I walked down to the range by myself and started gathering up the equipment. I had finished making the pile for my first return trip when a very eerie feeling came over me. The sounds from the camp up the hill faded away, and it was perfectly quiet and still, not a whisper of a breeze. There was a humming, or a vibration in the air that I sensed in me, if that makes sense. For some inexplicable reason, I snapped my head to the right to the view of the tree line and noticed there was an area with thinner brush, kind of like an opening, and I started walking towards it, almost like I was being drawn. As I cleared the tree line and stepped into the woods proper, I could feel the pull to go deeper into the woods, and it became much stronger. Looking ahead, the woods were in deep shadow, with a strange group of four trees about 75 feet away, lit by a shaft of light beaming at an angle from the ground. The light wasn't the normal afternoon yellow sunlight, but a very strange golden color. The light hit the trees in a way that the bases of the trees were glowing in a beckoning way. With the rest of the woods in shadow and the trees lit up, it almost created a weird tunnel vision. The compulsion to go investigate the four trees was now almost overwhelming. The thought of, come see, come quickly, come right now, was insistent. My head was pounding, like a headache without the pain. As I was about to take another step forward, another, separate feeling came from the depths of my being, and it started screaming at me to stop immediately. I instantly viscerally knew that despite how enticing this call was if i proceeded forward towards those trees i would be lost to the world that specific impression lost to the world scared me deeply the feeling of this is not right and danger were palpable to me this somehow overrode the compulsion i quickly looked backwards to the opening and i could see the bows sitting on the ground and I think seeing a bit of reality helped me break the hold of the call. I suddenly felt a hollow pit in my stomach, and I started tracing a path slowly backwards towards the opening. I kept my eyes on those tree lines like I was facing down a predator. I didn't want to turn my back on them. I couldn't turn my back on them. 
making it back and stepping through the opening to the archery range. My head almost instantly cleared. I could again hear noises from the camp and feel the wind. I looked at where I had just stepped from, and it now felt normal. I immediately grabbed the first load of equipment and headed back to camp. For some reason, I didn't tell anyone at camp what I experienced. On my subsequent trip to get the last load of equipment, absolutely everything was normal, but I stayed the hell away from that opening. What stands out to me is the lost to the world impression. It was so clear and ominous and final. I can't express how truly drawn I was to go deeper into those woods. The feeling to give myself over to it, whatever it was. I do know that something not good would have happened if I hadn't heeded that warning. I know that my experience was very real and very scary. I'm also convinced that I wouldn't have come out if I had kept going that day. This happened around August of this year. I'm not sure what we experienced or if there was anything odd about it, but whatever. It also is a bit of a long post. Sorry about that. So this was a hike up to Half Dome. We had a campground about a 20 minute drive from the trailhead and the group was composed of me, an 18 year old male, my cousin, a 32 year old male, and my uncle's friend. I'll call him D. There were two girls with us, but they aren't really relevant to the story. My uncle and his friend are both Christian, so there were no substances consumed that could induce the feelings that I'll be talking about. We get to our campsite, set up camp, and go to sleep after eating. We plan to wake up at 4 and start the hike by 4.30. I randomly wake up at 3.30 a.m., like completely wide awake, and look out of my hammock. And I remember feeling this odd feeling as if I was woken up by something. And I remember looking out at the moonlit scene. The moon was very bright for some reason, and thinking to myself, it looks like a dream. I lay back in the hammock but can't go to sleep, and end up waking up my uncle and friend at 3.50. My uncle asks me, were you walking around at night? And I say no, and ask why. He says he woke up for some reason, and could hear someone walking around. Not an animal, but a person. I say, huh, weird and we brush it off. We get to the trailhead around 4.30, and as everyone is unloading from the car, D says that he's going to use the bathroom, which there are a couple of before the trailhead. I walk behind him for some time before falling behind and waiting for my uncle who forgot something in the car. The short, straight road from the parking lot runs directly to a T intersection with the road to the trailhead, and the bathroom is directly across from the intersection through a field a little. Those who have been there know what I'm talking about. We get to the intersection and wait for D to come out of the bathroom. We wait about 10 minutes before I go and check the bathroom. He isn't there. I get back to my uncle and tell him that. He says, hmm, weird. Maybe he went back to the car or something. And we decide to wait a bit more. By 5.10, we begin worrying. My uncle goes to check the car while I wait at the intersection to make sure we don't miss him if he went down the road away from the trailhead. My uncle returns, says he isn't there either. We decide maybe he went up the trailhead without us for some reason and walk up there in about 10 minutes. He isn't there either. We're both kind of baffled now because there are no other logical places that he would go. I decide to run back and check the car and bathroom again. I meet him halfway before I get to the intersection. He's sweaty and disheveled with a weird look in his eyes. I say, where have you been? He says that he went to the bathroom and when he got back to the intersection that we weren't there and that he just assumed that we went to the trailhead and started walking, and then met me. I say, what do you mean? We waited at the intersection for over half an hour and checked the car, bathroom, and trailhead, and you weren't there. He says, well, I don't know. I went to the bathroom. He then asks me where my uncle is. I say at the trailhead. And he asks me again. I tell him again. And note that it was weird that he asked me twice. As we're crossing the bridge to the trailhead, he sees a light off on the riverbank and exclaims, oh, maybe that's him. 
and I just look at him and keep walking. I thought his behavior was very strange, like he wasn't thinking straight. We finally get on with the hike and it goes by as normal, except that we seem to keep losing things, such as my uncle's small red flashlight, one of the girl's gloves, a water bottle, etc. It's like we just simply forgot about the items and couldn't remember where we could have left them. On the way back, it got dark and we returned on our flashlights. As we near the end of the hike, after the two waterfalls, it begins to seem as if we've been walking for far too long. My uncle also confirms this, asking me, doesn't it seem like it's taken way longer to get back? I say, yeah, I was just thinking that. We keep walking, but it still seems like we weren't making any progress. I've been on that trail many times, and as I was walking, I couldn't spot any familiar landmarks. It was weird. There was this odd feeling in the air, sort of a slight menacing feeling. It's hard to describe. I remember thinking, it feels like the woods are alive. We were marked three more times about how long the hike is taking, and begin to laugh at it because it felt so ridiculous. After a bit, we finally and suddenly find ourselves on the final stretch and make it back to the car. Now, all of this seemed odd at the time, but I just brushed it off. I only realized how weird those events felt after we got home and my aunt asks my uncle, were you camping? And he says, yeah, how'd you know? As we didn't tell them where we were going since it was kind of last minute. She says that she had an odd dream where she sees my uncle in a tent in a forest somewhere and someone is outside of his tent. She says she couldn't see who it was, but knew there was a presence there. She says that she woke up around three and had a strong urge to pray for him and she did. My uncle kind of looks at me after that like, are you hearing this? I honestly don't know what to make of all this, but I wanted to post it to hear your opinions. I've told this story to several friends, family, and co-workers, partly to tell a weird experience I had in the forest and partly to see if I could get some insight into what I had experienced. I'm also interested in hearing what people who are reading this think what happened. I have photos of the area that I'm hoping to attach to this post. I'm originally from Northwestern Ontario and have been in and out of the forest my whole life. I grew up hunting, fishing, camping, and I've gone on many remote backcountry canoe trips. I've also worked in the forest for a few different jobs. I've always felt very comfortable in the forest and have never had a bad experience. That was until working in the forest near New Liskard, Ontario. I was working as an ecologist in the district of North Bay, Ontario. As an oncologist, I had many different jobs that brought me to the every end of the district. One of those jobs involved conducting inventory on old logging cut blocks. This is something that I have done multiple times over multiple summers in different areas of the province. This particular block was located west of New Liskard, about a 45 minute drive out of town. The area was very rural, with farm fields and the odd farmhouse scattered throughout. While driving the roads, it was common for other vehicles to stop and stare at you. This might have been because we were driving in a marked truck or that we were the only people that the locals didn't recognize. The block we were looking for hadn't been cut since 1995 and was located down this old, rarely used logging road. The two of us were tasked with collecting data on the block. To get to the block, we had to turn off onto this overgrown road that barely fit a truck. The road had many mud pits that nearly sunk our truck at multiple locations. When we couldn't drive any farther, we had to walk the rest of the way back to the block which took about a half hour. The work started the same as any other day. While we worked, we talked about office drama, funny experience we've had, and what good movies we've watched recently. As we got further into the block, I started to feel my chest get tighter. As we continued, I started feeling like we were being watched through the trees. These feelings got stronger the further that we traveled into the logging block. 
I tried to shrug them off until my co-worker suddenly stopped reciting the data that we were collecting, looked at me, and said, I have a terrible feeling about this place. We then discovered that we had both been feeling like we were being watched, and that something wasn't right about this area of the forest. We continued our work with the unsettling feelings persisting. As we continued further into the cut block, keeping our conversation, we suddenly stopped dead in our tracks, dropping the last word that was uttered. We both heard what sounded like two people having a conversation. This we couldn't comprehend, because we were in a remote area, deep down this almost undrivable trail on which we saw no sign of anybody. Then, another hour walk into the bush to get to our location to in the cut block. The forest was too thick to be of any use recreationally, and it wasn't hunting season. What was also troubling was we couldn't make out what was being said. The voices would continue for a few seconds, then disappear as quickly as they started. Once they stopped, we would continue our work, but be stopped in our tracks as the incomprehensible voices would pick up a few minutes later. This pattern continued until we came across trees that had been bent over and snapped. Now, it's not uncommon to find these trees bent and snapped from bears, moose, and even the weather, but what was odd about these trees was their proximity to other trees. We would find a tight cluster of trees with the middle trees snapped and others untouched. The trees were also free of any rub marks or scarring. Then we came across a patch of young poplar trees that was completely surrounded by an almost perfect circle of dense spruce and pine trees. Within the patch, almost all of the poplar trees had been snapped and bent in different directions, but the surrounding evergreens were untouched. Neither of us had ever seen anything like this before. And with the feeling that someone was watching us, we quickly got out of the area. As we moved back out of the block, the voices stopped, and the feelings of dread and being watched drifted away. We both expressed that it felt normal again, when we were only about a half hour walk away from where we had the experience. I've shown different foresters the photos looking for an explanation, but never received a clear answer. The best I received was, maybe the soil composition is different in that location but all expressed how they had never seen trees broken like that. I've asked First Nation individuals from different communities and have been told by multiple people that what I experienced was a bad omen that shouldn't be talked about. Now that I type that out, I'm starting to have second thoughts about whether or not this is a good idea. What made me decide to post this on this thread was partly seeing others' weird experiences in the forest shared on this thread, but also learning that two women had disappeared from the new Liskert area, Julie Diane Fortier, lived in Elk Lake, Ontario, upriver from the cut block I worked, and went missing in 1980 after taking the bus to school. Five years to the day she disappeared, her school bag, running shoes, and coat were found near Haleybury, Ontario landfill. The landfill is located roughly six kilometers away from where she's supposed to be attending school, and roughly 50 kilometers away from Elk Lake. Another five years pass before her remains are found by a couple along a dirt road outside of Haleybury. Many speculate on what happened to her, but the mystery was never solved. Melanie Ethier went missing from New Liskert in 1996, when she was on a one-kilometer walk home from her friend's house. She was observed walking by multiple people on this one-kilometer walk home, and seen crossing the Armstrong Street Bridge near her house. The last stretch of her journey involved a poorly lit black road, where she disappeared without a trace. To this day, Melanie's whereabouts are unknown. I'm open to ideas on what I experienced in the forest of northern Ontario. My job continues to involve me slogging through remote areas of Canada. To this day, I have never felt the way I did in the forest, near New Liskard, Ontario. My mom became silent and disoriented on a familiar hiking trail and came close to getting lost. I will preface this by saying that my mom died of cancer four years after this incident, so this isn't an urgent medical mystery, just something to think about. I believe it sheds some light on how intelligent people can go missing and become disoriented on familiar trails. To set the scene, 
This took place at a local, county-run park, with lots of hiking and walking trails in the woods. This park directly connects to a United States National Park, so lots of people will hike along the three-mile connecting trail and walk between the parks. The county park is popular and has plenty of trails in good condition, and thus is well attended, especially in warm weather. These parks are also popular in the region because they're pretty much surrounded by ever-encroaching suburbia, though 100 years ago this was a rural area. I was 13 years old at the time. My mom was 55. This took place about 10 years ago. My mom and I went hiking one summer afternoon on a trail that we knew well. We had both taken it numerous times in the past 8 to 10 years, whether together, alone, or with other people. It was still daylight, but the sun had begun to approach the horizon. We had just reached the top of a small-slash-medium-sized hill, and were probably not walking too fast at the moment when my mom just stopped walking. She had turned around and was looking to our right, where the view was a bunch of tall, skinny trees through which one could see the low afternoon sun. Looking at this area while walking would probably have created a strobe effect with the bright sunlight, as the many narrow trees passed between the sun and a person's eyes. So there she was, standing still, facing the trees off the side of the trail. She didn't respond to me at all talking to her, waving my hand in front of her, trying to look into her eyes or poking her, this was worrying to 13-year-old me, who still depended on her for a lot. Before long, she sat down on the ground. This was a controlled movement. She didn't just fall, but she still wasn't reacting to me. The seated position she took in the middle of the trail reminded me of how a child would sit, similar to crisscross applesauce. So my 13-year-old mind wondered if she was somehow reverting to childhood. Her eyes remained open the whole time, I managed to get her cell phone, it was either in her hand or pocket, and she didn't react to my attempt to take it, and I called my dad's office. He didn't pick up, as he was likely busy at the time. I decided that if the situation didn't change, I would call him back in about 10 minutes and leave a message on the line that paged his beeper. At this point, I started praying for my mom. After a few minutes, she became responsive again. She knew who I was and didn't panic at the situation. I think she may have been reluctant to get up and get moving, but we started walking again. I couldn't get any clear answers out of her regarding what happened. About five minutes later, we came to the point where the trail that we needed to take to complete our loop and get back to our car was a branch off of the straight trail that we were on. I took this branch, but she just kept going straight. I had to run back after her and make her come with me to the correct trail. She said she didn't know what was the right way and asked me to properly guide her. We had never gone straight on that trail, so she was definitely disoriented. If I hadn't been with her that day, and she frequently went this way by herself, she would have wound up somewhere unfamiliar, and I don't know what would have happened if slash when she became fully lucid again. She probably would have called someone on her phone, but that still may not have guaranteed that she would find her way home. We got back to the car and she managed to drive us home. Before long, she was fully lucid and back to normal. And to my knowledge, this kind of situation never occurred again. When I brought it up to her once or twice at points afterwards, she dismissed the situation as just caused by the light coming through the trees. I don't know how she perceived the incident or how she remembered it. The whole experience was rather unsettling for 13-year-old me, who'd never had to help my parents like this before. I realized that this had been somewhat similar to a briefer incident that had occurred at a grocery store within the year before the woods incident. When we took our full cart out of the store at the end of the shopping trip, she dazedly began pushing it towards the main road rather than the parking lot. I had to get her to turn in the correct direction. She was somewhat disoriented, but she managed to drive home fine. Later, she remarked how she couldn't believe she had been able to drive in that condition. Indeed, she referenced this incident more than the longer woods incident. So what happened? I think Reddit's armchair medical experts would call the Woods incident some kind of seizure, based on how they interpret other hiking incidents, like another one that I read before, and given how my mom gave the light coming between the trees as an explanation. Maybe it was connected with her eventual cancer. Maybe it was something else. We moved on and didn't talk about this much in the remaining four years of her life. If this story contributes anything to understanding the concept of missing 411, 
It's this. An intelligent, seemingly mentally normal person who knew the trail well suddenly went silent and stopped reacting to normal stimuli. Then, the person started walking again, but was very disoriented and dazedly took the wrong turn. If I hadn't been there, she could have become permanently lost. This would have been more dangerous in a larger, more remote park, with more dangerous environments and no cell service. There is absolutely a scientific, medical explanation for what happened. Something mundane but unexpected like this could be responsible for many disappearances. My family is from the Caribbean, and my aunt told me about an experience she had as a child. This had to have happened almost 50 years ago when she was around 8 years old. I don't want to write my aunt's real name, so let's call her Jane. So, Jane lived in a small village that was surrounded by forests, sugarcane fields, and rice paddy fields. One day, Jane and her cousins decided to play a game. Jane and her cousins knew this forest extremely well since they played there every day. After a while, they noticed their cousin Jack was missing. They searched everywhere for Jack and called out to him, but he was nowhere to be found. Eventually, after an hour of searching, they decided to send one of their cousins to run and get help. Jane's uncle arrived a little while after and began helping the search for Jack. Another hour passed, and the uncle came upon a thick growth of thorny vines and bushes. He heard shouting coming from nearby. There were so many thorns and vines, and it was so thick that he had used his cutlass, like a machete, to cut through. There was no way anyone, even a child, could get through. That's how thick it was. When he finally cleared a path, he entered a small clearing, and Jack was sitting in the very center. He asked Jack how he got there, and Jack had no memory of what had happened after they started playing the game. He also had zero scratches on him and his clothes were clean with no dirt on them at all. There was no way that he could have gotten in there. My aunt says my family thought it might have been a doin', which in folklore are these fairy-like creatures that have feet that face backwards and try to lure people into the forest. Does anyone know of any missing 411 cases in the Caribbean? I thought this kind of fit it, though I'm still new to this missing 411 topic. A little while ago, I was watching this creepiest missing 411 found alive video. There was this one story about a woman who was lost for two days. When she was running around in the woods, she saw a group of people with backpacks on a hike together. When she saw them, she yelled out for help. But instead of responding, they stood there staring at her. She kept yelling to them, and they wouldn't respond to her but kept staring. When she came closer, they'd move behind a tree, obscuring their faces from her. When she backed up, they'd come out from behind the tree, still staring. Is this a common phenomena? I tried googling this and nothing relevant came up. This didn't happen in a national park. It was in a remote camping area in Maine. So, my family owns a cabin with an outhouse about 10 yards up in the woods. The path to the outhouse is lit at night, and there's a light inside the outhouse, so one night at about 1 a.m., I wake up needing to go to the bathroom, so I head to the outhouse. Then, just as I'm about to open the door and head back down to the cabin, I get this deep-seated fear. Something telling me, do not open that door. I didn't hear or smell anything. It was just like this voice inside my head whispering, 
Don't open the door. I must have sat there for like 10 minutes until it felt safe to open the door. I never told anyone, but my sister, my family, is full of skeptics. I've been reading through a lot of the top posts and I had something I wanted to share. My ex-girlfriend's brother disappeared in Yosemite a long time ago and they found his stuff neatly folded and put off to the side. They eventually found him several miles from his stuff, fortunately alive. This was no surprise to me and my exes. He was severely depressed and wanted to unalive himself. He tried to die of exposure, but it was summer and he was not at a high enough elevation to freeze to death. Their parents didn't want to believe that he was unaliving himself or depressed. They simply assumed he was just fine, and it was all some kind of mystery. A lot of these cases of missing people sound very familiar to this case, with the neatly folded things and no trace of them and stuff. He told us that he just wanted everyone to find his stuff easily and leave the world seemingly having his life intact. Sometimes it's not a mystery. Hey everyone, I know this is primarily a United States sub, but I'm from Australia and had a strange experience near my family farm a few years ago that seems very familiar to some that I have read on this sub. So here it goes. I live and work on a farm in Southwest Victoria, Australia, and one of my jobs and hobbies is going hunting for deer to eat and some kangaroos to control their population as they breed incredibly quickly. A few years ago in spring, I was wandering along the boundary of our smaller farm that my granddad, or Nano, in Italian, cleared for farming, and the bush when I saw a path leading into the dense underbrush. I climbed over the rickety old barbed wire perimeter fence and headed down it to a particularly thick part of the bush I knew I hadn't explored thoroughly before. By the way, for my American folks, when I say bush, I mean the forest. When hunting our local species of deer, most sandbar, but we also see hog, fallow, cheetal, and red deer, it's best to move in stops and starts so you fit in with the general bush noise and sound more like a prey animal rather than a predator on the prowl. So here I was taking five steps, stopping to look around me, and then taking another five steps, and so on, when I noticed that my last five steps were unusually loud, or rather, everything else had gone quiet. No cows bellowing in the distance, no wind in the gum trees, or the sound of screeching cockatoos passing overhead. Just a dead silence. The hair all over my body stood up. I unslung my rifle from my shoulder and cocked it, thinking maybe I was being stalked by wild dogs. I was wrong. As I looked around, my existential dread mounted, and when I saw him, I thought I was going to pass out. He was off to my left and was kind of a blurry caricature of an old man wearing a red hat and pretty much no other distinctive features. It was hard to see him clearly. It was like I was going through a heat haze, but I knew that he could see me just fine as the dark spots he had for eyes were locked with mine. Standing about 20 meters to the left of the path among the ferns and underbrush, I could not see his hands. That is, until they lifted into view holding an ax. That was, unlike the man-thing, quite solid and clear to view. That movement snapped me out of my shock, and although I was terrified and didn't know what the heck I was looking at, I raised my gun to my shoulder and pointed it at him, and started to back along the path cautiously. I passed a tree, which hid him from my view for the tiniest moment, and with that he was gone, and the sound was back. With no warning, I could hear all the usual sounds and see clearly all around me. I was still terrified and pretty much sprinted out of the bush after that. Admittedly, a roo jumped out of the bush not far down the trail and I popped off a shot out of sheer fright, missing it. 
I got to the edge of the paddock again and legged it to my oot, sped home, and slept with my gun under my bed that night. Nothing exactly like this has happened to me before, although I have had some weird encounters in the bush. In the same area, the Kurds River Valley, there has always been rumors of weird happenings among the farmers and locals, including some stories like my own, although differing in the details. I don't know what happened or what I really saw, but it shook my view of reality and changed me as it gradually sank in that that was some kind of messed up paranormal activity stuff and not just someone playing a joke. I didn't talk to people about it immediately, but have since, and my uncle was shocked when I told him and explained to me that a similar experience happened to him as a child in the mountains near Mount Hotham in a little town called Brigitte that had at point hosted a satanic cult but that's a story for another time thanks for reading this and stay safe in the forest or bush I walked from Coppell to Louisville Lake on a 12-mile trip for Christmas. I was alone at night. I did it for recreation. I walked over 12 rivers, streams, and a lake. The thing that always gets me is these missing 411 people take off their shoes. When I run a marathon, I never get this feeling. Mile 6 of my suburban walk, I had a strong desire to take off my shoes. I decided that I wouldn't, no matter what but I had that desire for the second half of my 12 mile trek. When I'm walking with others, this barefoot feeling never crosses my mind. Another thing that struck me was I took breaks to rest on the bridges. The lake and stream were attractive. I think some of this missing 411 is human nature, but weird because it's not cultural to the United States. Before we get to the extra rain at the end of this video, I would like to thank all of my channel members, Anon Q, Mathematica, Christy Goodall, Recovery BMX UK, Cherry, Cheryl Taylor Harris, Lindsay Chavez, Flat Booty Biscuits, West Virginia Angel, Jamie Gavisk, Shay Shay, Lexi Liu, Xanax Master, Dark Poison, Michelle Dixon, Spike 2021, Patrick F. Corey Maloney, CeCe's Castle, Charity McVeigh, Tom H., Jess and Dave McDonough, Melissa E. Gandra, Salvador VL, Derek Slink, Randy Music, Brooklyn Lindbetter, Skin Crawler, Lisa Thompson, Liz C., Melissa Robinson, Board Short and T., Natasha Strom, Sarah Rodriguez, Melissa Reddy, Kayla Johnson, Skittle Britches, Carlyle's Von Oswegen, Furberry's Fables, Taryn, Brittany, Said I Would, Inner Scare Wifey, Ruby Wilson, Vanita Tillman, Jennifer Moyer, Bendy and the Ink Machine, Chili, Cutie Patootie, Cappy Karma, Pamela Curran, Paul Reese, Fia Mash K0101, and Honey Pond. Thank you all so much for being members. I appreciate it so much. It really does mean the most. And to everyone, thank you for watching. Good night, everybody, and enjoy the extra rain. Good night.